following program on Ada Terna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. taking the time to join us here on Other Than a 24 on a special presentation where we're about to bring to you a very key topic that is, uh, of course, making its round in the public sphere recently, not just relating to our country, but also across the globe, and that's on humanitarian efforts. And today we're specifically going to focus on the South Asian region and in Sri Lanka in particular. And to talk about this topic, we have someone that's very well suited for this program, and that is Ms. Menaka Kalyana Ratna, the Global Head of Employee Relations at Save the Children International. Thank you very much, ma'am, for taking the time to come to our studios today to speak about this topic. Uh, a little bit of an introduction into Ms. Menaka. She has quite the extensive uh, background in humanitarian work, and she recently has won the Gold Award for Excellence in Strategic Leadership in the Humanitarian Work Sector for the Top 50 Career and Professional Women Global Awards. So safe to say we're in good hands when it comes to discussing and breaking down this topic. Uh, ma'am, without any further ado, of course, can Congratulations on your award of excellence. Um, we have to get into the, the very basics before we get into the topic in particular. Could you please give us a little bit of a brief intro into exactly what your current role is right now as the uh, when it comes to global humanitarian efforts, specifically at Save the Children International and also with the other work that you pursue? All right. So currently, I'm the global head of employee relations. So this is part of the human resource management. And uh, my work in particular is more to do with problem solving of people. Because when we are working in an organization, people do have their grievances. They would have their complaints. And we, it's, it's, um, it's our responsibility to respond to them, to take it seriously, and make it a better kind of a working condition for everyone. So very simply put, that's what I do uh, in a global scale. So I uh, kind of cover six, over 60 countries, uh, and I have five regions uh, which are demarcated for the ease of management. Uh, but any person that's working for Save the Children, if they do have a grievance or if they do have a problem, uh, we do have a kind of an online platform through which they can reach out to me, and I would then respond to it. Or if it requires an investigation, I would investigate and d uh, direct people who are responsible to give a response to, um, to address them promptly. Exactly. Ma'am, I think it's important for us to get to the specifics of your role when it comes to the South Asian region as well, especially when it comes to Sri Lanka. Uh, what, does, what does your responsibility entail when it comes to humanitarian efforts in our region? Okay, so uh, it's interesting that you asked me this question because prior to this global head of employee relations role, I was uh, Asia's regional safeguarding director. So my work was to ensure that the work that we do for children and with children does not harm children in any way. Now that sounds a little silly because we are working for children and we are save the children. But we do have volunteers, we do have staff, we have consultants, we have contractors. So there are lots of people who actually work for children on behalf of us. So safeguarding is, you can say it is the, the CSR of the humanitarian sector, making sure that our programs, our people, our processes are safe for children. So, uh, so if, if I take an example, if we, um, you know, my, maybe most recent experience was working in, uh, in the camps in uh, Bangladesh for Rohingya uh, communities that were displaced or made re made, became refugees. And there were one million people. And they were living in camps. They were not allowed to come out. So we had to provide everything for them within those camp situations. So making sure that anyone who came in touch with children through a programming, through a di distribution of items, does it with respect and that the children are not exposed to any danger because they are already very, very vulnerable. 
and making sure that we deliver our programs effectively and efficiently so that the children still get to enjoy their rights, the right to protection, right to education, right to survival and development. Right. So what, what I completely understand from this is there is a lot of intricate back-end work that goes into the, the output, the final uh, reaching out and contact that we have with the, one of the most vulnerable uh, populations across the globe, of course, and that's children. So considering how the chain of command works, there's a lot of delicate processes that are involved when it comes to dealing with this group of individuals. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention to the, the South Asian region when it comes to current humanitarian efforts. If you could uh, give us a little bit of an understanding into the, the, the critical nature and the, the challenges that we see faced in our region specifically when it comes to humanitarian efforts, especially considering children as well. All right. So um, very broadly, I think anything that happens in a country or in a region impacts on children, right? If you take um, a political situation like in Bangladesh or an economic crisis or even the climate change, the huge impact is on children and children are not responsible for these situations, right? So that is the crisis that we are globally facing, not just in South Asia. So, uh, and then what it, what it does to children is that they lose their present. Because we have this trend of this notion that children are our future. But they cannot get to a future, or they cannot think of a future unless we address the present, right? We need to treat them as citizens. They have a voice. They have their own opinions, and these are hardly considered. You know, I, I don't think any one of us were consulted as children. So it's it's uh, it's our duty and it's our responsibility that children's voices are heard, and that they express their concerns to us. You know, what's best for them in the immediate, uh, you know, uh, aftermath of any kind of crisis, but as well as in the long run. So uh, the climate change is a huge uh, issue that the children are facing. And children are now coming forward. And we are facilitating that dialogue between children and children deciding and voicing their opinions on what needs to be done. And of course, as Save the Children, our work is based on children's rights. And it is the founder of Save the Children actually who declared rights for children 100 years ago. And uh, in that, you know, children have, uh, children must enjoy their rights to become productive, useful citizens. So if you, if we uh, look at the entire region, uh, countries are, are signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but implementing those obligations have been quite slow because children are you know, not seen, not heard. So it's, it's, it's the biggest challenge to recognize children as individuals as, and as human beings who have rights. We have that inherent issue always, wherever we go, we see that despite there being legislature and conventions and treaties that have been um, brought forward, we don't see much of the implementation aspect. And I believe that is, uh, of course, a key part of your job in, in order to ensure that implementation actually happens uh, and, and the children's voices are heard, as you said. Uh, Ma'am, I think it's uh, very essential that we talk about how exactly the work in the South Asian region reflected on your performance and on how you chose to go forward uh, in the humanitarian sector, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the role that you do now. Yeah. So I started my, uh, my uh, journey in humanitarian work 24 plus years ago as, uh, as an in information and communications officer. And my dealings was, uh, were mainly to do with advocacy uh, you know, through media and also directly with the state authorities to make sure that they understand their obligations and support that process. And as an organization, we continue to work with the, the state authorities like the National Child Protection Authority in Sri Lanka, the Ministry of Education, to help them, you know, deliver on their promises. 
and on their objectives. So to, uh, to um, expand this a little bit, currently Save the Children in Sri Lanka, um, we provide a mid-morning meal to 900 schools across uh, eight districts, right? And you would agree, uh, Anradi, that you know, given the situation that we faced post-COVID, the economic crisis, feeding a family is a challenge. And children drop out of school because they do not have three meals. So this has made sure that on the one hand, children receive their health and nutrition. Then they continue to come to school because it's attractive and it's also, you know, they don't have to study on an empty stomach. And uh, so they, they retain that right to health and education. And school always gives a sense of protection for children, because if they don't go to school, they will be pushed towards going for work, right? So then they, they will be exploited uh, by different people. Or there is always uh, the challenge of children being trafficked. You know, we do have a situation, although we are a little island, there is trafficking that happens within the country. Uh, so addressing those uh, kind of really crucial issues for children right now is actually making sure that their future is much secure than if it was not addressed. We have to make sure, as you mentioned earlier, that the, the, the child's present is protected in order to ensure that they have a future in the first place. Before we go in for a break, uh, ma'am, I'd like to, to uh, direct your attention and also to get some insight into disaster-prone areas. Of course, we uh, as an island are not completely foreign to the concept of natural disasters, having uh, experienced a tsunami as well, uh, and other multiple catastrophic weather events over the years as well. We've seen uh, a bit of an increase uh, relating to that even recent times also. How exactly have we translated proper humanitarian assistance and efforts in our country uh, and also South Asia in general uh, when it comes to protecting the children? Right. So it, it is uh, the climate change, of course, it comes in different forms. It can be a cyclone, it can be floods. And what we have been experiencing in the recent past, even today as children are going for uh, I mean, this week they are going for uh, their uh, A-level examinations. They have they they are experiencing adverse weather. So, uh, of course, the the responsibility lies with the state authorities. We have the uh, disaster management centers, and uh, also children are now more aware uh, of what their responsibilities are in terms of you know uh, recycling. Uh, or reusing things, uh, using less plastics, and being more uh, care, more caring towards our own environment. Uh, so, things that we have done over the last maybe ten years, probably post tsunami, is making children aware of uh, disasters and how to ris to reduce the risk of disasters. And I do remember this ex uh, exa uh, t t like superb example from the south of Sri Lanka. This was probably uh, about 10 years ago when I was working in Sri Lanka, where one of those children who we have trained uh, came to school uh, in the morning. It was raining. And he immediately identified the, the signs of landslide in his school. And he made sure that all the children who had already come to school were evacuated. And of course, there was a massive landslide. And he saved a lot of lives. Right? So through awareness, not only children, everybody can be a hero uh, and save lives. Because certain things cannot be avoided. Right? So it, it, really, it, it is important for children to understand that they, they, they can play a role in protecting their environment, protecting their communities. So similarly, of course, you'll see uh, children uh, being present at these COP meetings, at, the, at these global conferences, and urging the leaders, not only in South Asia, but urging leaders to you know, take action, because uh, it, is, it is the future of the children that we are not taking care of. And it is, of course, our responsibility. So there's this, uh, children also have this right to advocate for their own rights. And we need to help them to achieve that so that their voices are really heard and then 
those are taken into consideration. We shouldn't just be doing you know, protective advancements towards children, but they also have the right to knowledge and the right to awareness in order to protect themselves against any issues that they might come across as well, as we have heard from your very uh, relevant example. We do have to get into the specifics on how, uh, what role communities play when it comes to humanitarian efforts as well, mm -hmm. and also what we can expect moving forward with the advancement of humanitarian efforts in our region and also across the globe. But before we get into any of that, let's take a very short commercial break. This is a special presentation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to a special presentation on humanitarian efforts in South Asia, in our country and also across the globe. We're in conversation with Ms. Menaka Kalyana Ratna, the Global Head of Employee Relations at Save the Children International. Ma'am, I believe we embarked on a very informative topic, a, a good base, uh, a premise for, for what we're about to discuss moving forward in this segment as well. And that's specifically, I'd like to put our focus on the public participation and, and the role that a community will play when it comes to the enforcement of humanitarian uh, standards and also humanitarian efforts and the furthering of that. Uh, if you could explain to us, ma'am, exactly how essential is the, the community aspect of, in humanitarian efforts? Okay, so as, as a community, as Sri Lankan, uh, we are very much prone to charity, right? We would like to give things and it is really, really necessary, you know, to help the needy. But in that whole process, I think where the humanitarian approach is different is that we respect the rights and the wishes of the people, right? So, for example, if we are collecting something to be given to people, we need to first consult them and do what we call a needs assessment. What do they really need? Because sometimes we think they need the food and the clothing. But often we find that a community would want uh, the food for their uh, um, you know, cattle or their chicken, right? which we don't think of. right? So it's really important as you mentioned, to make sure that we consult them first before we intervene and identify what is their exact crucial immediate need and then address it. And the other thing is that they should be the decision makers in their lives, right? Which we sometimes in our charitable approach, we tend to kind of overlook that. So if, let them decide you know, what they want to do. Uh, let them plan, uh, you know, wh what's, you know, what's their next step. And may, they may not have that capacity, so we, you can still facilitate, uh, which means it takes longer than the just immediate handout, right? And something that we learned, I think the whole world learned post-tsunami, is that dependency. Because during the, in the aftermath of the tsunami, you know, lots of agencies, the whole world was like, you know, they're outpouring with support. Ended up with people just receiving, you know, lots of things. Some people who didn't have a boat had three boats, right? Or they had four sewing machines. Uh, so, and then they decided, some of them, not all of them, decided not to go to work anymore. Because here the funding was coming and they were getting more and more things. And then it stopped one day, and then people were lost. So we, we, we really need to make sure the humanitarian or charitable support doesn't make people dependable, right? Because it should give them that kind of kickstart to you know, continue their lives and do better than they did before. So it's really important that the consultation or the involvement of the community is done from day one, and they understand that there is a day that this stop, this help is going to stop, and that they have to move on on their own. And this is kind of lifting them from where they are to do better and to take care of their uh, their, their families because it's their responsibility to, to take their, uh, take care of their ch uh, families and children. So uh, it, it's so the first thing is I would say like do not create the dependency. And of course, even some humanitarian organization may have created that. 
But that, that is something, a huge lesson uh, that we have learned in the sector. So that we give the people their right to decide and we do not make them uh, dependable on uh, you know, external aid. That's a very important uh, aspect as well. When it comes to dependency, we, we always see that help is quick to come and also uh, very abrupt to leave. And then, of course, some are left blindsided uh, because they were not fully prepared in, in actually understanding that this is very ephemeral and we don't really have this kind of support forever, uh, which is why empowerment and knowledge and empowering the actually affected regions to take their own uh, charge when it comes to their situations. How do humanitarian organizations tend to balance, especially in our region, mm -hmm. uh, we see it because of the, the climate catastrophes that we have faced, um, when it comes to quick and you know fast assistance and, and also building long-term resilience, if we could dwell a little bit further in, into what you just explained to us, uh, ma'am, how exactly are organizations supposed to balance this? Yeah, so I think the important thing is whether there is a disaster or not. I think the long-term development has to continue. So there has to be a shift between a humanitarian response and a long-term development program. And this is what, you know, in the sector that I'm in, what, how we are kind of trying to balance both this. Because sometimes you need to scale up your uh, operations if, there is a, if there's floods. Right? There will be funding, so they, you need to kind of make sure that people are in a safe place and then they, in the long run they go back to their homes. And of course there's government assistance to rebuild their houses. But then uh, how do you continue? Right? Uh, so one of the things that most of the humanitarian organizations do, including Save the Children, is to work hand in hand with the state sector and make sure that even when the funding is over, there's continuity, right? Uh, for example, we work with children, so we set up children's clubs, and the children then uh, are uh, able to engage with the duty bearers in the state sector, in the government, to bring their issues directly uh, to, to, the, uh, to those authorities and find resolution. So even when the, uh, the humanitarian organizations step out, the work has to continue. I, I think that is what we call this is what we call as sustainability, right? We shouldn't be there like forever, but we should be able to move in, uh, move out, and help another community and make sure that these uh, processes are, are going very well. I'll give a quick example. I, I hope uh, we remember there was a there was a big calamity in Mithatamulla when the garbage dump collapsed, right? And of course, it opened the eyes of everyone that these people were living in very, very uh, bad conditions. And the state provided them with uh, accommodation. Uh, it was like a block of flats. So we worked with the communities while they were displaced. And we worked with them, helped them to move into a more formal kind of accommodation because they were not used to living in flats, right? Even the operating of a lift, which was in the building, was something new to them. So we had to hold hands, but the, the child clubs that we set up, the children were uh, uh, able to identify the vulnerable children in their midst. Some children who were abused, the, the children themselves brought to our attention. So we could provide them with the services necessary from the government, right? And years later, when we just paid a visit, uh, you know, the children were meeting the, the divisional secretary. They were very confident and very comfortable with speaking with uh, government officials and pre presenting their progress as well as their problems and asking for support. So we were very happy because, you know, we have moved out, but the work was continuing. And the government officials were also respecting the children and their views, and they were meeting them regularly. Uh, you know, like just like they would meet the adults, they would meet the children's groups to find out whether they are okay or whether they had any concerns or whether there's even, you know, whether something was broken in those block of flats. So, and that is how it should be. Like, you know, the people should ch take charge of their lives. And what better time than when you're a child to, you know, be a leader because these children then grow up to be leaders of their communities.
we can see that that essential the the primary building of, of taking accountability and learning how to interact with officials and authorities and also understanding that that you are not a voiceless individual and and just a vulnerable uh, minority or vulnerable uh, group uh, there is some sort of power that you can hold and also exercise uh, upon when in a country like Sri Lanka I believe that is uh, what we see as the most essential part of, of recovery when it comes to affected regions specifically for South Asia ma'am how do global practices like now of course taking accountability and teaching children autonomy is is something that's a little bit revolutionary for our culture specifically uh, and specifically in areas of, of disaster stricken areas basically what other practices that we have seen in, in the global scale have been translated to better fit South Asian cultures and standards? Uh, this model of you know, child clubs and child advocates, this is being now recognized. In every country in South Asia where I can speak about our organization, that process, because now it was 1989 when when the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was presented and all the countries um, have signed up to it, right? But for it to really take effect is to recognize children. Uh, we have been able to do that and we are not the only organization that sets up children's clubs, uh, you know, for the benefit of, ch you know, children. So these uh, kind of engagement uh, being recognized has really worked, you know, and it has uh, really brought a lot of um, positive uh, outcomes for children in terms of um, changing laws even, right? Uh, I'll give a simple example. Again, I, I like to focus on Sri Lanka because the audience is Sri Lankan, but um, the, the laws for children, right? Uh, has been quite archaic, right? And I remember a time many years ago when the age of criminal responsibility is written as eight years old, right? So can uh, an eight-year-old child take responsibility for plucking a, a guava from someone's tree, right? Very simple. We all have done things like that. And uh, so eventually these uh, Laws, although it's not completely changed, but the awareness that has been raised with the legal system has, you know, uh, changed. At least the practice has changed, right? So, um, so things like that, if the laws can be changed through advocacy, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to fight about it. You just present the facts through uh, research, and uh, uh, kind of closed door discussions with the right people in the authorities. This has changed a lot of things. If you take in uh, also in South Asia, but also very much so in Africa, there's child marriages, right? Now, those countries are changing their laws and protecting girl children, particularly girl children from getting married under the age of 18, right? So I think the strategy uh, is not just getting onto streets and going for marches or you know voicing uh, slogans, but actually having good healthy conversations with the lawmakers, with the uh, decision makers to make those substantive changes so that it helps children, you know, in that whole in entire country, because it's it's so little what an international humanitarian agency can do, but. A lot can be done within a, a change in a policy or a procedure in a country. A community can step up and, and change doesn't need to be uh, loudly exclaimed. It can be quiet discussions and, and essentially changes to legislative frameworks and treaties and charters that we see can translate much better when it comes to the end goal, which is assistance and support for these minorities and the vulnerable uh, affected communities. We do have to speak about safety concerns and political barriers as well, and what we can expect going forward in the future when it comes to humanitarian efforts in our region and also in Sri Lanka. Uh, before we get to the details on any of that, let's take a very short commercial break. This is a special presentation. We'll be right back with the final segment after this.
Welcome back to this special presentation. We're in our final segment in discussion with Ms. Menaka Kalyana Ratna, the Global Head of Employee Relations at Save the Children International. Ma'am, once again, thank you very much for the previous two segments. I believe we've covered a lot of ground when it comes to our region specifically and also how uh, we have seen developments in our region as well. We have to talk about a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, that is, when it comes to the efficacy and also the effectiveness of, of humanitarian efforts in our region and how it has been um, either furthered or we've seen setbacks relating to funding issues, political barriers, maybe community uh, reluctance. Uh, if you could explain to us with your experience uh, what you have seen so far in the current context and in if it's in at a good place now or if we have a lot of work to go moving forward. Yeah, I think, yes, we, uh, my organization is over 100 years old, and it started, you know, during the Second World War. So it's, uh, it has never been an easy task because when you're advocating for change, particularly speaking uh, on behalf of the marginalized or the minorities, it's not very, it doesn't sit well with many people. So uh, over the years, in many contexts, we have seen uh, including in South Asia, uh, that the humanitarian uh, sector or organizations are looked at as agents or, you know, they're just collecting the money, they're not delivering on, uh, you know, their promises. Uh, so th the sector itself has really come a long way to be held accountable, right? So organizations, they do multiple audits on the income and the expenditure and the reach of uh, you know the recipients or the beneficiaries and uh, the suspicions of course you know somebody trying to voice uh, uh, the the kind of narrative on human rights or children's rights can be looked at as like you know what's you know you know what's uh, their ulterior motive right so that uh, that suspicion has now gradually improved because I think both the, the state and the non-state sectors are working increasingly together. And uh, for years and years when you have worked, uh, you know, there's respect, mutual respect that is gained. And uh, this has actually helped, uh, particularly the humanitarian sector, to be more accountable, not only to the donors or to the governments, but to the people. Because the people need to know you know, what is the amount of money that an agency is getting and how it is being uh, allocated to them and uh, how they can question what are the uh, mechanisms there that are available to the community to complain because complaint response mechanism is a, is a really crucial part of uh, the humanitarian work because the people uh, receive this sub support not because somebody feel uh, feels that they are less fortunate or marginalized, but because they have a right to that assistance. So uh, all these things have really improved a lot. And we, um, again, I, I bring the Sri Lankan uh, examples. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do provide this mid-morning meal, which is a very healthy, nutritious meal. And of course, cooked meal is a very risky thing to do because a little thing can go wrong and children can fall ill. So, and I remember uh, during the COVID period, the same project we were able to discuss with the authorities, the, uh, the, particularly the Ministry of Education, and provide the same food as dry rations to families, right? So, so we didn't have to stop that. And of course, I have met so many mothers, particularly mothers, saying that was so helpful because we didn't have an income. And this, these dry rations were not just feeding one child, but the entire family, because the, man, the mothers were really able to manage the, 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 the support. So I think things like that can be negotiated because the donors are also um, aware of you know, what the real needs are. And also the authorities are very supportive to, uh, to uh, implementation of programs which are in line with the, uh, the country's objectives for children. So you really need to, uh, you know, understand and align your work 
with the priorities of the country that you're working in. Because as a, as a humanitarian organization, we have our global policies. Even for human resources, we do have our global policies. But we are under the country law. So we, you re, we need to remember that, that we are in a country to support that country and not to intervene or interfere or to disrupt things. That is something that's very essential that needs to be understood even, even for those that are being helped by this service, that they are not acting uh, outside of or beyond the law that's already enacted within that country or region. So we can rest assured that there are no malicious intents or issues that can arise when it comes to the legislative aspects Absolutely. as well. Um, we have been speaking about the donors, the government, and also the uh, individuals that are receiving the, the help and assistance they need. But we haven't really focused on, on the actual individuals that have been carrying out these efforts and, and being on the ground and working face-to-face uh, -face with uh, these affected communities. Um, how exactly does an organization like Save the Children, in, in your experience, how have you seen the protection of humanitarian aid workers uh, evolve over time, specifically in our region? Well, it is particularly when it comes to armed conflict, that, is, that has been quite a challenge and it continues to be a challenge in different you know, situations. Um, in uh, where, like, if you take uh, Gaza or Ukraine, where there's continuing continuing wars, because if you look at a uh, natural disaster, you know, it floods, the water recedes, and then you can pick up and you can do your work. But when it's ongoing, it's it's you don't see an end to it, right? And of course, our country in Sri Lanka, we we have been through a war, so we know that you, it, it, unless you see a ceasefire or an end to the war um, through whatever means, it, it really challenges you every day. So there is uh, handouts to be given, there's advocacy, uh, advocacy to be done at national or at international levels, and then you need to make sure that your people are safe, uh, physically safe, mentally safe, because Sometimes experiencing a trauma of other people or even yourself going through trauma in the long run can damage you. So uh, organizations provide psychosocial support to our own staff as much as we do for affected communities. And well-being, uh, staff well-being is, is a very key component, not only in the humanitarian sector, in all sectors, right? So. Uh, it, it's the, the evolution within the humanitarian sector has been really great. So in the last 24 years, uh, when I joined, I remember like we did not have any safety security uh, being looked into. Like we had vehicles, we used to travel at odd hours. But now we do have very strict policies. We have something uh, called the after dark policy. We cannot travel once the sun sets. We have to stay wherever you are, find accommodation. So we plan our days very well so that we, we reach our destination before dark. Because after dark, there can, the, the, the rate of accidents are much higher than during daytime. So this is, if you ask the Sri Lanka police, they'll tell you that most accidents are after dark. So we, we, we are really, uh, we do have different teams looking into safety and security of our staff. There has been situations where our staff have been uh, abducted by armed groups in, in different countries, right? So getting them released, because as a, as a humanitarian organization, we will not pay ransom, because the money is for the people, we are not to pay ransom. So negotiating such releases, uh, this, is, uh, this is a different uh, kind of an approach. Like, you know, we, uh, we find, uh, extremely talented, trained professionals to do, to do those negotiations and get them back safely. And uh, so, so these are the ch challenges that we have faced. But through these challenges, the sector has vastly improved in our accountability, in our safety, in our well-being approaches, and uh, you know, making sure that as part of someone's role, they are not put to risk. Like for example, uh, there are certain countries, if I am to visit them, 
I have to make sure that in the last two years I have attended uh, certain trainings that will make me more prepared for a situation of hostilities or abduction or how to survive in a, in a hostile environment. So those trainings are given to us. If not, if you haven't you know, completed that training, you are not allowed to go. Like, so we are strict about the well-being and safety of our staff. So m I think most of the international organizations do this to make sure that uh, our people are safe because people are the most important thing for us, for us to uh, implement our programs. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an evolving kind of a situation, right? So going forward, whatever the future challenges that we may face, we will definitely beef up our operations and make sure that our staff are safe. And finally, ma'am, um, unfortunately, our time is coming uh, very quickly to an end. Uh, before, we, before we end off, uh, I'd like to ask you in a final question, the importance of, of furthering humanitarian efforts and humanitarian assistance in our region specifically. If there's a message you'd like to leave to our viewers, uh, the importance of participation when it comes to humanitarian efforts. Yeah. So I think looking at the landscape in terms of funding, it's really decreasing. It's uh, amazingly uh, decreasing because if I look at 2000, when I started my journey in uh, humanitarian work, uh, the donor funding was much more relaxed. But now it's very specific, very targeted. And, uh, it's, and donors are also getting tired of, you know, sometimes, sometimes the bureaucracies that we come up with. So um, the message would be, I think, for each country, each community to be uh, independent and strong so that they have their own systems. Because what I, as a Sri Lankan, what I feel is like some of the good practices that we had in our culture, this has been disrupted through sometimes the humanitarian aid. So how do you really get back some of those uh, good practices that would make us stronger as a community without depending? Because I think I, I started talking about the dependency. That dependency in any context is not healthy, right? that independence, the community voice, being together, being productive, and uh, being able to look after each other, I think that should be the way forward, because humanitarian uh, work shouldn't be just for agencies to do. It should be, you know, if, if today my community is impacted by a disaster, then I should be able to have my people around me and uh, work towards rebuilding our own community. So I, for me uh, personally, I like the people to understand their own capacities and capabilities and be strong. It's not just to leave it to international organizations to do all the humanitarian effort uh, work and the heavy lifting. We all have a part to play in, in our Absolutely. respective communities when it comes to ensuring that we either prevent disaster or build up from whatever issues that we have uh, faced in our community. Unfortunately, ma'am, uh, our time here with you today has come to an end. Thank you very much for taking the time to explain this very diverse topic to us here tonight. Ms. Menaka Kalyana Ratna, the Global Head of Employee Relations at Save the Children International. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for the time. And with that, we are coming to a conclusion on this discussion. If you had missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch this and all the other discussions at our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again next time. Have a great night.